Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. We Hello. left you there for a minute. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's get right in. Let's get right into it. Yep. Uh, awesome. what, what was the What was the inspiration behind starting the Ultimate Fighting Championship? On a personal level, I got my my butt kicked when I was a teenager training for the Golden Gloves by a wrestler, and uh, I never forgot it. Um, and I write about it in my book, Is This Legal? So that was my original inspiration. And later, when I got to um, the, uh, the Armed Forces, the Marine Corps, I was stationed in, um, in Red Beach, Da Nang. I had some friends of mine who went to uh, an R&R in Bangkok, and they came back with a story of a, a match between a Thai boxer and an Indian wrestler in a, in a Bangkok nightclub. And, uh, you know, we used to sit around and talk about that type of thing. You know, could Bruce Lee have beaten Muhammad Ali? So that was my original inspiration. And then years later, I'm working for an ad agency, and uh, my boss has a client uh, that imports beer. And my boss said, come up with some great ideas that we haven't presented to them before. So I did. And one of them was for a, a concept that I had been thinking about called the world's best fighter. And it was going to be a tournament, and it would bring in all the great martial artists from different martial arts, and we'd see who the big, great white shark was. That was my inspiration. Now, I, I read, I actually visited the site, uh, is this legal, the book dot com, and it, and it also mentioned oh, that I, I believe, I believe, yeah, it's it's awesome. It's so inform informative. It was just a great experience. Um, I read there that you were actually watching uh, videos too of the Gracies. Is that correct? Well, you know, as part of my research for the world's best fighter, my secretary came up with um, an article in, in, a, in a magazine, uh, Playboy, September 1989, and it was about the Gracies. And uh, the article about the Gracies gave me, you know, some insight that there was um, uh, that there was somebody in the states who was practicing what I had researched about in Brazil called ballet tudo. You know, there was a long tradition going back uh, to uh, you know, after World War One in Brazil, where at circuses and the gyms and, uh, uh, you know, even um, uh, in different martial arts schools, different stylists would get together. So I actually then uh, tracked the Gracies down. Um, it took me a while to get an appointment with Horry and Gracie. And he asked me if I'd ever, you know, been on the mat and rolled, and I hadn't. So uh, I did, and I actually became the first student at the new academy. It was a coincidence. He was making out new cards, transferring people over from where he'd been teaching them in his garage in Redondo Beach. So I became student number one. He had about 150 students. And the, the, the guy who took a class after me was, um, uh, was John Milius, the film director and screenwriter. And, uh, you know, sometimes we'd end up in Horian's office talking about, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, who could win if you put a boxer against a wrestler? And uh, Horian, in this article, it talked about the Gracie Challenge, but he'd never gotten anybody to accept it at $100,000. Everyone turned him down or didn't have the money. So they were doing in the back of the school what they had been doing with their family in Brazil. Uh, you know, guys would come in and say, hey, I want, you know, I'd like to see what I can do against you, and they'd say, great. And they would roll, or then they'd spar. I never saw a lot of blood. In fact, I never saw a broken nose. And afterwards, there was a lot of camaraderie. The Gracies and they would shake hands. So I, I had this experience then of seeing that there was at least one martial arts group in America that wasn't afraid to get it on. You know, I, I could be wrong on this, but if I'm not mistaken, I believe jujitsu is the, the gentle art if, if you translate to English. Am I right on that, or have you ever heard that before? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, when you translate it from Japanese, it does translate to the gentle art. And, um, you know, they, uh, their, their um, father and uncle had learned it from a visiting Japanese uh, businessman and martial artist, um, Maeda. And uh, this was in the city of Belém, Belém, B-E-L-E-M. And um, uh, he eventually became a naturalized Brazilian and taught uh, Elio uh, Gracie's brother, Carlos, uh, the basics of jiu-jitsu. And, and, you know, uh, uh, Elio was only 140 pounds, and he used to just watch uh, his brothers doing it, and he was kind of sickly when he was a boy, so he kind of picked it up by watching it, and eventually he became the, um, 
uh, the, the number one fighter in the family. He became the most competitive. And um, the true story is, is that they adapted what they learned from Maeda, uh, and they, you know, they, they adapted it so that it worked well for them. They emphasized ground fighting in particular. And, um, you know, when you say the gentle art, jiu-jitsu, though, unlike judo, which had been extrapolated from, you know, from, um, from, from uh, jiu-jitsu, uh, you know, they, there were holes, there were throws, there were chokes. So, you know, it was a gentle art in the sense that they weren't kicking and punching and striking, but they were, um, you know, putting people in arm locks and arm bars. And um, there were others not necessarily connected with the Gracies that relied on ankle locks, but they all employed chokes. So most of the fights I saw ended up in a, you know, in a triangle choke or a, a naked rear choke. You know, that's actually one of the most fascinating things about the Gracies. I actually saw a lot of their videos, you know, growing up and even in my teenage years. And, I'm, you know, it's just I, I couldn't believe as a youngster I'm looking at these guys and they're, they're a lot smaller than their opponents. And here they are just choking them out, getting arm bars, you know, rear naked chokes, all that stuff. And it was just the most yes. fascinating thing I've ever, I had ever seen. Well, you know, it was also interesting when it finally came time later on, uh, and Hoist Gracie became the, uh, you know, the, the representative of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Uh, you know, he was not the biggest guy. He was 175 pounds, basically. And, uh, you know, we had him up against people who were a lot bigger than he was. And, uh, you know, yeah, that was one of the amazing things to see a 175 pounder be 215 pound Ken Shamrock, the shoot fighter. But, you know, I always tell people that, you know, that my, my job, uh, or, you know, and I talk about it in Is This Legal, was that I had to sell everybody. I was the promoter. I had to sell everybody on this idea. Uh, it took me a year and a half to sell Orion that we weren't going to do the Gracie uh, Challenge. Uh, I wanted to do this world's best fighter tournament. And I actually convinced him by doing a free advertising campaign for him for his instructional videos, and it brought in a lot of money. So then I had his credit, you know, I had his attention, and uh, we then recruited uh, his fellow, you know, this student, John Milius, the film director, to lend his name to the project, and I wrote up a business plan. And then I had to go convince, you know, uh, the investors. We had 27 investors come in. Three of them were couples. There were a total of 30 people. And um, then I had to go and convince somebody in TV to be our partner. And I got turned down by Showtime, by HBO and by ESPN. But I eventually found a partner in Semaphore Entertainment Group that were doing concerts and uh, comedy shows on pay-per-view. And um, we, uh, we eventually did the show, and of course, as you know, November 1993. You know, you actually, was, uh, that you actually answered my next question. I was going to ask you, uh, how did that relationship come about with SEG, and why do you feel as though they bought into Ultimate Fighting? Well, that's... Um, uh, you know, that's a good question because um, they uh, had been primarily known as a concert promoter. Um, right about the time they did the UFC with us, they had Andrew Dice Clay, the comedian, in a pay-per-view. Um, but they had been looking for a franchise. They were doing one-shots, meaning they would do a single show. You know, maybe let's say with a concert. How many times a year could you come back with new kids on the block, you know? Uh, so you would do one concert with them, and then, you know, it might be another two years that you might do something with that particular act again. So they were looking for a franchise. They were looking for an ongoing series. And uh, when I called them in April of 1993, this is already three and a half years that I've been trying to get this thing moving forward, um, uh, the, the man that I reached, Campbell McLaren, was um, uh, very bright. He had a degree from uh, Berkeley. He had studied at MIT. Uh, he had been involved in the Catch a Rising Star nightclubs, you know, in management. So he was a smart, knowledgeable guy. And when I presented this to him and sent him a fax the next day, he got it. They sent me a ticket. I came out, and they were uh, certainly unsure of the market. There was nobody there that knew anything really about fighting or, or martial arts. And um, I, I came out and pitched them, and I could tell that they were very interested. I came back on a second trip. They flew Orion Gracie and myself out. We'd already formed this company now. By that point, I had already formed a company up in Colorado because I found that Colorado had a loophole in the law that enabled us to do bare-knuckle fighting. So I formed an LLC corporation in Colorado. 
Orion and I, uh, we you know, uh, did a presentation to investors, and I closed, you know, 27 investors on coming in. So when I went to New York, all I really needed now was a TV partner. And by the time I, we went for that second business trip to New York, they were ready to go. And uh, they already knew that HBO and Showtime had passed, but they were looking for a franchise. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, I thought we lost you for a minute there. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and then and then my and then my next job was basically to recruit the fighters because I was going to be the booker and the matchmaker of the show. It would make no sense to have Orion involved because he had his, he was going to have one of his brothers in there, and that would have been a conflict of interest. Uh, speaking of fighters, uh, I was as I mentioned, I was checking out is this legal to book dot com, and and I came across a very interesting page that had a, a wish list of some of the fighters you had hoped would have taken yes. the help, uh, would have participated. Yes. And one one that stood out to me, and maybe this is me being biased, was Mark Gastineau, who uh, who played for yes. my hometown, uh, New York Jets. Oh wow! Um, oh right! <laughs> I was like, I could not believe that. I was like, oh my god! Like, you know, now looking looking back from that list. Was there one one particular fighter that that you would have liked to have participated more than any of the others? Well, you know, obviously, if we could have gotten, you know, a, uh, a one of the top heavy ten heavyweights, and I called the boxing gym, the Cronk Gym in Detroit, I called the Joe Fraser's gym in Philadelphia, and everywhere I went, uh, you know, the boxing people laughed at me. They said, you know, uh, top heavyweight is not going to do this. The more they consider the martial arts a joke. That, you know, if you were any good at punching, you would have become a boxer. So uh, I got turned down on, on and, and I would have liked any one of the top ten. Um, I eventually was able to get a top ten cruiserweight, Dar Jimison, out of St. Louis. So to answer your question, I would have loved to have gotten a boxer. I would have loved to have gotten a top Olympic wrestler for the first show. And I had reached out uh, to Dan Gable at the University of Iowa, who at that point was retired and a great coach. And I was trying to get him or his assistant to return my phone call because I wanted a top Olympic wrestler. I had seen videotapes in the Gracie Academy of Olympic wrestlers rolling with Hicks and Gracie, and I knew that the wrestlers would be very competitive. Uh, I also wanted a sumo wrestler, and it was very tough to try to get a sumo wrestler out of Japan for the first show. I was able to get someone who had been in sumo who was living in Hawaii and had been in the Makashita class in sumo in Japan, got kicked out for misbehaving, but it was very hard to get uh, sumo people out of Japan. But uh, we, we looked at Gastineau because in 1991 through 1996, he had a professional boxing career, and he was a Hall of Famer as a defensive lineman for the Jets, as you know. Uh, that, you know, I, I could not even believe that. Like, this is like the first time I've ever heard any of this, like, about, about you know, Mark Gaston. I was like, wow, I didn't even – I knew he had the boxing thing, but I had never yeah. known that you, you actually wanted to – you know, that was one of the oh, guys, yeah. you know, that's, and, and speaking of, uh, another page actually shows guys that ultimately turned down uh, yes. to fight for the UFC, and that yes. just includes, I mean, the one that stands out to me uh, was Dennis Alexio, who who most people yes. don't know, he played John claude Van Damme's brother. That's right. That's right. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and by the way, at the time, uh, he, he was really the best North American kickboxer. He had been involved in a bout with Stan, Stan Longinitis in Australia where he broke his leg, and uh, he was widely regarded as the best North American. But you'll notice, though, that, and it's, you'll notice not only on the website but in the book, that I made sure to go to Europe to get a European kickboxer because they were very experienced in the Muay Thai uh, leg kicking, and I wanted someone from, from Europe who could kick to the body. You know, it's it's crazy because I, I was doing research for this, and the guy went, I believe, 68 and 2 with 63 knockouts as a kickboxer. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. That it was, uh, you know, you know, and, and I, I, love, you know, I love to tell the story in the book that, you know, most of the people that I knocked on their door, they thought I was crazy. You know, they turned me down or they just blew me off the phone. Uh, it, it was a struggle to get fighters for the first event, but then it became easier and easier. Uh, once people saw what we were doing and that this was not a one-shot, we were going to keep doing this every few months forever and keep finding the world's best fighter, um, then it became easier. Then people started to come to me. Um, eventually, I got a Olympic gold medalist in like Mark Schultz and Kevin Jackson. 
you know, on my wish list, though, for the first show was Alexander Karelian, who had won a gold medal in Barcelona uh, in Greco-Roman and was known as the experiment. Six foot three, 285 pounds, 4% body fat. And I had as much chance, though, of getting him from Russia as I would have had to get Mark, uh, uh, you know, Mike Tyson out of jail. Mike was in jail at that time for rape in Indiana, if you remember. And so there was no chance I was there. And I couldn't have afforded. And I couldn't have afforded a Hulk Hogan or a Ric Flair. I couldn't have gotten them away anyway from the WWE. They wouldn't have. Their contract wouldn't permit that. But, you know, that goes to show you what I was trying to do was, unlike the traditional Marx approach where I was going to just put karate and, and taekwondo people and judo, I decided I'm going to bring in everybody from everything because I think that's what the fans would want. They're going to ask that question. Hey, how would a guy from, you know, Kung Fu San Su do? Or how would a, uh, you know, how would a, a Russian fighter from Sambo do? And I think we did that in the early shows. We answered a lot of those questions. Now, now you mentioned, obviously, that a lot of people were turning it down. Do you feel as though guys were turning this down because maybe they felt as though this whole concept was just simply a novelty? You know, that was, I'm sure, part of it. I think you're right about that. I think the other thing that would be true is I think that, you know, a lot of these guys were, you know, teaching not only school, but they had seminars that they were doing. They had a seminar business. And if you came in and lost and you got badly, you know, whooped, this was not going to do your business any good. I'm sure a lot of people turned me down because they, it would have only, they, they were worried that maybe if they didn't win and they didn't look good winning, that it could only hurt their business. I'm sure a lot of people turned me down on that basis. Also, money was a factor. You know, I offered Alexio for UFC 5 $50,000 to fight horse in a super fight. He turned me down for that. He turned me down twice. He turned me down once for the UFC for the tournament, UFC 1, and I offered him $50,000 for UFC 5 in a super fight. He wouldn't do it. So, you know, I think you've answered the question very well yourself. I think there were, they were maybe in the beginning it might have been where they worried it was a novelty. Was it even real? You know, where, where, is it, where there really going to be no rules, just no biting and no eye gouging? Uh, you know, who, who were we? How legitimate was this? But later, I think it also became very much of a question of, uh, could this do harm to my business? And I respect that because all of these guys were making a living, you know, teaching people that what they were doing was, you know, uh, terrific. It was invincible. It was the way to go. Their art was supreme. Well, it all makes sense now. They were worried. I mean, it's something we see in today's MMA where they're worried about brand damage, like damage to yes. the brand. Yeah, of course. Exactly. Exactly. Now, now, most people I know, including myself, were very surprised when uh, Horion opted to go with Hoist over the much bigger, the much stronger Hicks and Gracie uh, as a Gracie representative. Uh, what were your initial thoughts about the decision to go with the much smaller Hoist I, I talk about it in Is This Legal because for, for several months, I just assumed it was going to be Hickson. He was the family champion. He had four professional fights in Brazil, um, I, and I mentioned those in the book. And um, But, you know, ultimately, Horian would be the one to pick someone from his family. And there was some, there was some issues with Hickson. Uh, Hickson had finally left the school. Uh, I, I, the, my understanding was that he had stolen some students and was now teaching them privately in his house or his garage, and Horian found out about it. And I think that caused some friction between the two brothers. In any event, Hicks, uh, Horian came up to me uh, late summer and said, by the way, he said, it's going to be Hoist. And I said to him, really? I said, gee, Hoist is uh, just a kid. I, you know, he was 26, but he always, to me, I always thought he was about 18. He, you know, he, he didn't have a checking account. He didn't have a bank account. He didn't have a car. He lived in a small apartment above Horion's garage. And uh, he, I don't think at the time he had a girlfriend. Um, he, had, his, he had a roommate. It was a fish tank, a six-sided fish tank with two piranhas. And to me, he was just a big kid. You know, so when Horion said, we're going to put Hoist in, I, I said, really? I said, he's the guy who babysits Sejina and Halleck, your two youngest kids. He said, well, you know, all right, first of all, he's a black belt. He said, I'm going to get you a letter from the association in Brazil that considers him the light heavyweight champion. And he said, look, he said, uh, he said, if Hoist wins, he said, look how good it's going to look for, for what I'm doing for, for jiu-jitsu. He said, you know, uh, Hickson is 190 pounds, 5 foot 10, and he looks very tough. And he was. Hickson was the Jaguar. He was a stud and a half. 
But Hoist looked like, you know, someone's kid brother. Little 13-inch biceps. He was kind of skinny in a way and kind of sweet and shy. So it was a brilliant move in a way on Horian's part. My, my first reaction was, you know, I think this is a mistake, but, you know, I said to Horian, look, ultimately, I really don't care who wins. Uh, you know, I, I've been studying a little bit of jujitsu, and I respect it, and I respect what you guys do, but I see this as an end in itself. This is going to be a franchise. This is going to be a franchise, and, and, you know, this is going to go on and on. And, you know, if Gracie Jiu-Jitsu wins, that's great, but, God, if they won every one, that wouldn't help the business. The public, you know, would want to see, gee, how come, you know, the, the, the karate champ or the kickboxer isn't winning? So, you know, my, at first my reaction was surprise, but ultimately I said to myself, you know, whatever he wants to do is going to be fine. Now, now the first UFC kicked off with a bang, literally, as less than 30 seconds into the first fight, uh, Gerard Gordeau uh, kicked 420-pound sumo, Tele Tuli, right in the face, sending teeth flying into the crowd. Now, uh, looking back at that first fight, how shocking a moment was that, and what kind of tone do you think it set for the rest of the night? Oh, there's no doubt about it that that fight was the greatest single shock, I think, in the martial arts uh, up to that time. Uh, you know, Bill Wallace, who I had brought in as a color, as the play-by-play uh, commentator, who, you know, was well-known as a full-contact karate fighter and kickboxer, he was shocked. You could see that it, it totally, you know, messed up his uh, commenting game. He, he was like, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. I had all the gold gym people there, their executives, the owners, Pete Grinkowski and his wife, they were all dressed in tuxedos sitting right by the octagon. And right after that bout, all the wives left. They got in the limousine and went back to the hotel. So that fight was such a shock because Taylor Tooley's tooth got shattered and pieces of it went out over Bill Wallace's head into the crowd, number one. And number two, uh, pieces of it lodged in Gerard Gordeaux's hand and foot. So, you know, you, you wound up at that point uh, in his foot. You wound up at that point with one punch, uh, one kick and one punch, which basically changed the martial arts forever in a way. And, you know. So, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was stunning for everybody involved, everybody. Now, now, obviously, we all know Hoist would win uh, UFC 1, submitting all three of his opponents. Now, I, I want to take a different approach here. What do you think might have happened had Hoist Gracie yeah. not won the very first UFC? I think, you know, the franchise would have gone on because, you know, um, this was all about the martial arts in general. You know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu was only one entrant among eight, you know, fighters total. So in my humble opinion, the UFC would still be here today whether or not a, a Gracie had won that first event. And you have to remember that very quickly after that, certainly by UFC 7, I was recruiting Brazilians who had jiu-jitsu skills who were not Gracie's. Does that answer your question? Yes, it certainly does, sir. Now, now uh, UFC 1 was a, was a great one. success. Uh, it, so, it sold nearly 90,000 pay-per-view buys. Uh, what were your expectations right. going in? What were your expectations going in, and were they met? Well, you know, uh, uh, in the book, uh, at the uh, chapter 12, I believe, uh, about the mass ball, I'm talking to Campbell McLaren, and he said, you know, we would have been thrilled if it did 50, and we kind of only expected a hike to 25,000 subscribers. So when we found out the following Tuesday that 80, almost 87,000 people had bought the event, it was a huge success, and we did 125 for the next one, and by UFC 5, we did 286,000 buys. And by the way, this was when the number of homes in North America that could get pay-per-view was only 33 million. Today, it's over 100 million. Well, that's, that's incredible. I mean, you know, to, to have such, such success at a time where, I mean, that the combat sport is just dominated by boxing pay-per-views and whatnot. So just to have that much success is just a testament to how great the concept was at first. The concept was first. And continues to you know, the, the other part of that, the other part of that, too, if I can add that, that's something, is that when I went to HBO and Showtime, 
they were very negative on the martial arts because kickboxing had done well for a short time in the 80s, and then it had faded. So there were actually memos that some of these executives had that said, if anybody comes to us with a proposal to do a martial arts event, just tell them no, show them the door. So I, I think that the success of the UFC was stunning because even the people in television were of the opinion that this shouldn't work. But I knew it was an age-old question. Going back to my days in the Marine Corps, we used to sit around and debate it. You know, could a boxer beat a wrestler? And I talk about it in the book, Is This Legal?, that this was a discussion that went all the way back, maybe to the Greek Olympics with migration, but John L. Sullivan, the heavyweight, the first long heavyweight champion, the old bare knuckle champion, had been, uh, had been uh, 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 taken down and uh, choked out by his trainer, who was a famous wrestler. And James Corbin, his successor as heavyweight champion, said eight or nine times out of ten in a mixed match between a grappler and a boxer, the grappler will win. So this has been something that people have been talking about for a long time. I knew that if we could create something to showcase this, it would be successful. Yeah, I mean, it, it should have been pretty obvious to people. I mean, you know, when you have a boxer or a kickboxer, I mean, obviously they're going to feel very comfortable standing up. But once they go to the ground, it's a fish out of the water. I mean, it should have been pretty obvious for those guys that, hey, you know, if I get taken down, there's no way I'm going to be able to get out of it. Well, you know what was interesting is when you look at the early UFCs, a lot of the kicker punches came in and felt, look, you know, nobody can you know, withstand my punch or my kick. You know, I remember at the first UFC at the press conference, we had uh, a man who brought a device to us that measured with electronics uh, and a pad uh, the power of a punch or a kick. And I remember that uh, the, the most powerful blow at the press conference was Jason Delucia's kick. And Bill Wallace, I think, came, came in fourth. And the second most powerful blow was Ken Shamrock's elbow. So, you know, uh, there was a, uh, uh, an odds maker in Denver at the time who picked Pat Smith to win the event. He had won the Sabaki Challenge a few months earlier, which was a bare knuckle karate tournament. He had been studying with Bobby Lewis, the U.S. Olympic, uh, the U.S. boxing uh, trainer, and had been taking some pro fights in Las Vegas as a boxer. So a lot of people felt you know, forget what the grapplers are going to do. The first time they really get hit, it's all over. But you saw what happened. You know, that's actually very interesting, and, and I've never really thought about that. Uh, and I'm sure nobody really talks about that in, in the community. But uh, the, the odds. So you said Pat Smith was actually the odds-on favorite. Yeah, there was a local guy who felt he knew enough about what we were doing to be able to give odds. And I think Pat was a 4-1 to one favorite uh, to win. And I didn't find that out until much later, but uh, I'm not shocked because early on, uh, you know, a, a lot of people in the martial arts were figuring, hey, a kickbox is going to win that event, you know. Uh, you know, but I tried to get Benny Urquidez in the event. You saw that from the website. I tried to get Dennis Alexio. Uh, I wanted to get Peter Arts, who was then starting to make a big name for himself in K1 in, in Japan. And Ernesto Hoos was at the same gym as uh, Gerard Gordeaux, but he was due to fight in Japan uh, the next week, and he wanted $15,000 as an appearance fee. So, you know, early on, it was hard to get everyone exactly that I wanted, but later on, it became easier. Now, that actually leads to this. Now, the UFC had plenty of ups and downs in the early going from trying to find states and venues of which to hold shows to facing tough opposition like Senator uh, John McCain. Uh, what do you believe was the key to the UFC overcoming such obstacles and continuing to prosper? Well, you know, uh, the frustration for us was that we were adding rules. I was adding rules uh, and new, uh, new elements to the show starting with UFC 2, by UFC 15, 85% of the rules you see today were in place. Uh, gloves, weight classes, restricted areas that you couldn't strike, uh, time limits, uh, judges. And uh, the frustration was is that no matter what 
we were telling the press, no matter what we were telling the cable TV people, people at that time, uh, you know, had picked up on the, uh, the, the blood sport aspect of it, and that's all they could think about. And the politicians, you know, are always looking in any economy for an easy target. And I think we were an easy target. You know, they, the mothers and the fathers who were worried about what their kids were watching could say, gee, why isn't this being banned? Well, you know, it was on pay-per-view. You had to buy it. You know, it wasn't as if a kid, a, an eight- or nine-year-old kid could watch this, not unless his parents gave him permission. You know, it's, 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 it's strange because you have a sport like boxing that's arguably more dangerous, and yet no one complains about that being human cockfighting or anything like that. So it, it always baffled me that, they, that you know, MMA was always, uh, uh, well, it was banned initially in, I believe, 36 states, and even to this day is banned in New York. But yet boxing is, is you know, you go 12 rounds, 36 minutes, and, and take a bigger beating, and yet it's still, you know, they, they look down upon MMA and not on boxing, so it, it's always strange to me. Well, you know, boxing uh, has a long history uh, in, in Western countries, and you know, if you look at anything, in any area of society, tradition in a culture counts very high. It takes a long time to overturn something that's been long established, and boxing has been long established as the ultimate uh, art of self-defense. From, from Western countries, especially in the, in the United Kingdom and the United States. So when MMA came along, you know, you're looking uh, at something which Americans at first were not familiar with. Uh, you know, kickboxing in America had been limited to uh, so many kicks around and above the waist in kickboxing. Americans weren't used to Muay Thai leg kicks. To them, that was dirty fighting. And grappling and, uh, you know, the holds and throws and uh, chokes of jiu-jitsu you know, also smacked of dirty fighting to Americans. So it's not surprising a way, given human nature, that something so new and something so radical, you know, compared to what people knew traditionally, was going to be rejected at first. You know, it takes a generation or more sometimes to accept something new uh, within a culture. And that's true for politics or art, music, films. Uh, sometimes it takes, you know, uh, 20, 30 years so here MMA is now 21 years old, and, you know, it's really moved into the mainstream quite a bit. And I think that's a great tribute to, uh, to the success of the UFC. But also, when you think about it, other than soccer, uh, the martial arts is the most widespread physical activity around the planet for young people, especially young men. And DNA is in our fighting. Our fighting's in our DNA. People like a good fight. So, you know, if you look back at history in Pancration, in the ancient Greek Olympics, within four Olympic Games, it became the most popular sport. And I think 20 years from today, MMA will be up there as popular as anything else on the planet when it comes to sports. Period. You know, it's, it's funny, Art, because I was, one day I was having a conversation with my grandfather, and he tells me, hey, you know, you want to see the fight of me. And I was like, well, is MMA on? And he was like, what are you talking about? I'm going to see the boxing fight. But I was like, well, how can you classify it as a fight? And, you know, an actual fight, kicking is allowed, going to the ground. I mean, it's, you know, we could say, hey, we're going to watch the boxing fight or the boxing match, but you can't just, just label that simply as fighting if it's not a lot of stuff involved in it. You know, I, I, I've gone through a mountain pass. I might have missed, have missed a couple of words. Could you Could you repeat that last part to me, my friend? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, what I was saying is I told my grandfather, how can you classify just boxing as just straight-up fighting when there's no nothing other than fists being thrown? If you're talking about an actual fight, there's going to be kicks, elbows, throwing to the ground. So that's what, sure. what I always liked about MMA is it represented actual fighting. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, as I say, I think that uh, Americans uh, in particular, USA, were not used – to any kind of a sporting contest that these types of techniques and tactics could be employed. So, you know, the, the first reaction was that we were doing something that uh, was not proper. I'll give you a good example. I went to Black Belt Magazine to Jim Coleman, the executive editor, and I asked him to cover the first event, to write an article about it. In fact, I even supplied him with a writer who had written for Black Belt, and he's in the book, Clay McBride. 
And uh, Jim turned to me and said, all right, this thing you're doing is dirty fighting. It's not good for the martial arts. We shouldn't be showing our children this. So this, I think, was uh, the attitude of a lot of people at that time. Yeah, it's definitely unfortunate. Um, now, every everyone that I talk to, every, everybody in general who has an opinion, has an idea of what they would do if involved with the UFC or MMA or anything like that. Uh, is there anything you would do differently that's being done today? I think, uh, first of all, I think the, the current UC, UFC management is doing a, a darn good job because, you know, that deal that they did on Fox brings this sport into the homes of millions and millions of people. And, you know, you look at what the UFC and Bellator are doing internationally, they're, all of them are in 140 countries. So I have no criticism of that at all. I think the only thing I would emphasize today, if I had some uh, role or responsibility, would be to grow the amateur MMA business. Because when you think about it, uh, you know, box, uh, uh, wrestling, baseball, football, basketball, and hockey are all done and practiced in the schools. Uh, but, you know, other than going to a martial arts uh, school after, after class, you know, in a mall, uh, we don't teach our children, uh, you know, the, the martial arts in school. So the amateur base for MMA really needs to be grown. I think there needs to be a golden gloves of MMA. You know, that's actually a great idea. I've talked to a lot of amateur fighters on this show, and they tell most of them tell me the same thing. It's hard to get a fight, or their management, you know, is bad. It's the, the promotion. I mean, there's a lot of complaints and gripes, you know, about the whole, you know, amateur scene. And, and, and I like that idea because it actually helps develop these fighters. I mean, if you look at it, like, we're at a time where, I mean, is there really a, a ton of amateur fighters that stand out? And if there are... Where are they? Why haven't we heard of them? Because there's no development going on. Exactly. And I, I, I love to, to use the example that years ago when I was a younger man, if, if someone was the national middleweight Golden Gloves champion, you looked at him and said, hey, I know what that means, and he's going to be going to represent the U.S. in the Olympic Games, and I'll bet a few years from now he's the middleweight champion. So, you know, there was, there was a track that was laid down in boxing, starting with the Golden Gloves and moving on to the Olympics and going into the pro ranks. And I think that MMA has to do something similar because the better, we, the better track that we build early on, the easier it is for fighters to grow, progress, and develop. Yeah, and, and I also think that it, 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 there's a lot riding on that. I mean, the, old, the, the long-term success of of MMA is, is I mean that thing is going to rely on on building the amateur circuit. I mean that's the future of the sport. You know I, I understand that's cliche and it's uh, you know it's the obvious answer, but sometimes the obvious answer is the right thing to do and that's grow the amateur scene. Yeah, I think I, I think that's going to happen. Uh, there's more amateur promoters today than there were you know a year ago or two years ago, but I think that more has to be done to create. Uh, a, a national championship. Uh, you know, there are 38 franchisees in the Golden Gloves for boxing. There are 38 states or regions that run a regional business to crown the champion, whether it's Chicago or, or, uh, or let's say, the state of Florida. So I think that something similar probably has to be done in MMA, and it will help the sport. Because today's young athlete needs to have a path that he or she can follow that will help them grow and decide how far they want to go. In some cases, a young man or woman may say, you know, I'd like to become the welterweight national champion. And after that, I'm going to finish my studies in college and I'm going to become, you know, a computer scientist. Another man or woman might say, you know, that I want to win the national championship amateur, but I want to go on and be the world champion as a pro. So we need to have these kind of, of steps and ladders for our athletes. I think it's going to happen. Well, that's one of the reasons why I always felt that the UFC should have hooked, you know, hung on to the WEC. I understand that they were professional there, but I think they should have used that as sort of like a, a secondary platform to really you know, grow an amateur base there, and then when they're ready, they can move right on to the UFC. I always thought that the WEC should have been used for that. That's interesting. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an interesting idea and a comment you have. Yes, I see what you're saying. Now, yeah. Now, the, the UFC just recently celebrated its 20th birthday last November. Uh, did that moment, uh, that time, bring about any reflections from you, knowing that you played a huge role in the creation of the UFC? 
you know, it was a, it was a, a very special time for me. I got a call in October from Dana, and he invited me to be uh, cage side by the Octagon for the 20th anniversary show. And uh, a month or two before, Fox TV had begun filming and did a lot of filming with me about the early UFC for a, a documentary that they were creating called 20 Years of Fighting, the History of the UFC. And uh, so when that, uh, that documentary aired in November, and uh, then the uh, 20th anniversary show on November 16th took place, it was a wonderful time for me. I was talking to a lot of people that I hadn't talked to in many years. A few months before Sports Illustrated, uh, for the uh, July issue, did a great article about the first UFC, in which I was quoted as saying, you know, uh, I, it was a great ride. I'm sorry in a way I didn't take the full ride, but it was great. And uh, not many men can say that what they do in life will survive them. This will survive me. So I was very proud, very proud indeed. Now, this is, uh, this is my last question for you, Art. Uh, without the benefit of hindsight, uh, how surprised are you that it actually was able to sustain like all the the early troubles and and actually make it to 20 years? I mean, I think I've talked to plenty of people that said, "Hey, I'm kind of shocked that it actually made it to to you know to 20 years old." Well, you know, um, uh, we we made good money with the UFC in the beginning, and then of course we were banned on cable in 1997. We all flew up to the cable offices in Colorado. And we're showing them what we were doing with the rules and the changes. And they just wouldn't listen. They, they already made up their mind. And Senator McCain had written a letter to all 50 governors. And the New York Times had called it human cockfighting. So, you know, it, it, was, it was a terrible time. And I had decided by, by that point to, uh, for Orion and I, to sell out our interest in Semaphore. I stayed on board for the next two and a half years until January 1998. And I thought there was a time there that they were going to completely crush it. So for me, to see that it has gone on and survived and grown is a thrill. For me to see now that it's 21 years old and imagine what it will be like if I live another 20 years is, is thrilling. Because, you know, there was a time there where we weren't sure that it would, uh, it would be allowed to continue. You know, it had a lot of enemies. You know, I'll tell you what kept it going. The fans. The Internet. And the fans got together, and they kept the spirit alive. And more than anything, when I talk to today's fan who's been reading my book and, who's, and I've done these interviews like with you today, the fans say to me, Art, we never gave up the faith. We would talk to each other on the internet and send emails. We'd text when the phones came in. We never gave up. And I think that the fans of the early UFC and of MMA is one of the greatest single reasons why the sport is here today, period. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I say, and, and, and it might be maybe I'm partial to the sport, and, and, and you know maybe I'm a slight bit biased, but I always felt like the MMA fan base was the single most passionate fan base in any sport. Compared to any other sport, uh, it's amazing. You compare it to baseball, even NFL football, the only sport I think that or activity that maybe – the fans are comparable, but you might say the WWE and professional wrestling. But the UFC, the MMA in general, the fans are passionate. They love it. And they remembered when, you know, when the establishment had banned it and, 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 and was taking it away from them. And the fans said, I want my MMA. And they got it back. The fan made it happen. That's why we're all, that's why you and I are talking today, because the fan kept this thing going. I completely agree. Now, before we let you go, Art, can you let us know where we can purchase your book? Yes, that's a good question. The book is, Is This Legal? The Inside Story of the First UFC from the Man Who Created It. It's available right now on pre-order from Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Just type in, Is This Legal? and Art Davies. It'll come up, and it's selling at a discount while it's on pre-order. On July 1st, it'll be in all the bookstores. Uh, it'll be in Crown Books. It'll be in Barnes and Noble. Costco will have it, uh, and there'll be an, uh, an ebook version as well. I believe the price is going to be nine ninety five. You'll be able to download it to your Kindle or to your Nook or to your uh, your iPhone or your Android device. So July first, it'll be everywhere. And as you found out already, is this legal? The book dot com 
is kind of a companion piece to the book because there'll be some things on the website that I couldn't even fit in the book. Some documents, some contracts, some pictures, photos. And if you enjoy the book, the website will help you enjoy it even more. That's just fantastic news. Uh, Art, on on behalf of our fan base, uh, thank you so much for your contribution to the sport uh, that we all know and love. And thank you so much for taking uh, the you know the last forty five minutes or plus uh, to chat with us here on MMA Jam Live. Thank you so much. Well, you have some great questions. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, you know, the MMA, MMA Jam rule, and I'm really pleased that I had this time with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you so much, and and please enjoy your weekend. All right, you too, my friend. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.